Julie Chavez Rodriguez, thank you for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ed, for having me. It's great to be here. So let's start big picture with about 400 days to go until Election Day 2024. The state of the race is what? Well, the state of the race is exciting. We're seeing so much enthusiasm out there, really in support of the president, the vice president, the agenda that we've put forward, and really our record of accomplishments that we've had over the past two and a half years. As we've seen our coalition of support continue to grow, you know, we've had major endorsements from 18 labor unions, environmental groups, women's organizations, um, most recently gun safety groups. So we're just continuing to really build that base coalition and continuing to really reach out to our election voters. And that is a good foundation for any re-election campaign to start with. But you know there have been questions raised, a lot of concern expressed. Let me walk through some of that first and then we'll move on to some other things. There are still some Democrats who believe that there should be an open Democratic primary. On a scale of zero to 100 percent, President Biden will be the Democratic nominee. Where on that scale? Zero to 100. I'd say 100 percent. You know, what we're seeing is a stronger and more united Democratic Party than I know I've seen in my lifetime. Um, you know, the Democratic uh, National Committee has never been stronger. They won, um, you know, record uh, elections in the midterms. Over the past, now it's up to 40 special elections that we've seen in 23 alone. Um, we have seen, you know, Democrats outperform. Uh, and so we're continuing to just really build on that record of success, that record of accomplishment, and that real unity. Um, we have a national advisory board made up of governors, um, you know, members of Congress, uh, mayors that are all united behind this president and vice president because they have seen really directly what they've done in their communities, in their states, how they've improved, you know, the lives of, of Latinos and so many others. Um, you know, as we look at lowering costs, addressing, um, you know, the uh, sort of uh, exorbitant cost of prescription drugs, um, $35 insulin, all of that is making a real difference in people's everyday lives. Not to mention the record unemplo low unemployment that we're seeing, job creation, bringing manufacturing back. All of that has really unified our party behind our agenda. So zero to 100 percent, he's the nominee, 100 percent is what you're telling me. Yes. Okay. Um, poll this week showed the Biden-Harris ticket down one point to a candidate facing nearly 100 state and federal charges. With all due respect, how is it that polling continues to show him either down or even with former President Trump, given everything former President Trump is facing? Well, you know, for us, we see that, again, our agenda has such strong approval ratings. And so it's contingent upon our campaign to make sure we're getting out and talking to voters, really connecting the dots between, you know, what they're seeing in their everyday lives as they see new roads and bridges get fixed, as they um, see affordable broadband coming to their communities, that they know that all of that is brought to you by President Biden and Vice President Harris and the agenda that we've put forward. And so we're going to continue to make sure we're reaching out, talking to voters, connecting those dots, and, and really making sure that they know that those things aren't just happening because, they're happening because of this president and vice president and this administration. And we believe that we deserve four more years to finish the job and to ensure that we are strongly rooting the kind of uh, economic progress and growth that this president and vice president have set afoot. So th the mindset is you've got 400 plus days to go, plenty of time to remind people, because ultimately the only poll that matters is the one on election. Day. Exactly. And I mean, for us, you know, it's the last, like I said, 40 special elections that we've seen in this year alone. Democrats are outperforming, um, you know, their counterparts. We're continuing to see that kind of energy. And it's something that we know we can build on. Um, for us, it's, you know, continuing to get out there, make sure that um, all of our coalition of voters, which we know are continuing to grow um, when we see, you know, more younger voters coming into the rolls, especially young Latino voters, those are voters that we know um, the Democratic Party um, can really have an opportunity to get to because they align with our values. They align with what it is that we're putting forward and the president and vice president's vision for this country, which is one that's going to bring us together. It's going to ensure that we have the fundamental freedoms that I know I grew up with my entire life, including, um, you know, the right to make health care decisions about my own body. I, I know you're uh, inclined and, and, and paid, frankly, to be positive and to be touting the accomplishments of the campaign so far and how strong you are. And you've pointed out the unity 
that exists at least officially across the party. But when you look at the state of the race and where things are shaping up, in your view right now, where perhaps are you most vulnerable to potentially falling short? Well, I think that, you know, for us, it's about not taking anything for granted, not taking any voter for granted, not taking any community for granted, and getting out there and doing the hard work. Um, that's why we are, you know, continuing to build a strong coalition of support. We're continuing to raise the resources that we know we need to build the organization in all of our key priority states come 2024 so that we have a winning campaign and we're ready to go. We know that, you know, our coalition of voters are also voters that um, are often, you know, leading very busy lives, that they are juggling multiple, you know, things like families, like, you know, their own sort of day-to-day -day work, um, other sort of healthcare needs that they may have. And so it's going to be important that we're getting out and reaching them early. It's one of the reasons why we invested so early on in a um, historic ad campaign that we're currently running right now. And it's across, you know, all of our battleground states where we know we have to reach um, general election voters. And so while Republicans continue to waste resources fighting amongst themselves and trying to out MAGA one another with the next, you know, most extreme position, whether it's a national abortion ban or continuing to scapegoat immigrants, we're going to have the competitive advantage and continue to reach out to voters that we know are going to help us win in November. Based on what you're seeing, is Donald Trump the nominee? Is it over on the Republican side? You know, we're not going to kind of make any predictions about, you know, what, um, who our opponent's going to be. At the end of the day, though, we're going to ensure that um, everyone understands, no matter who our opponent is, they're coming with the same extreme agenda that we've seen time and time again, whether it's from folks like Trump or DeSantis or whomever else may be. Um, but at the end of the day, we know that we're just going to continue to really put forward the president's accomplishments, his vision for the country. The fact that he has brought this country together under you know, such um, divided political times, and he's going to continue to do what he can and use his experience to pass historic legislation to make sure that we're creating you know, a new clean energy economy and really building for the future, not taking us backwards like so many of these Republican nominees want to do. Let's talk a little bit about you. You are uniquely situated for this role, having worked on the Obama campaign, uh, having worked, um, uh, or sorry, in the Obama administration. You worked on the Biden-Harris campaign. You worked for Senator Harris as your California state director. You're the granddaughter of Cesar Chavez, of course. Your parents ran the United Farm Workers. Um, you're part of a lineage, I would argue, that's one of the most important in American or influential in American Latino history, given what your grandfather and parents did, um, what you're now doing, uh, at least in politics. I got to believe it's a bit of a blessing, but sometimes a burden. Well, you know, I've seen it um, kind of as both uh, sort of a privilege, but also a, a responsibility. Um, for me, I see both as kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, the privilege part of it is that, yes, growing up, um, in a movement of people that were so dedicated to improving the lives of farm workers, that gave of themselves, um, that sacrificed so much that for most of my life, my parents were literally volunteers and made $5 a week because um, that's how the organization was run and sustained for so long. Um, to grow up in that environment was the most privileged experience a child could have. Um, but with that also comes that sense of responsibility and that knowledge that um, they sacrificed so much for um, so many others that now it was my turn to be able to carry that cause forward and to do what I can in my lifetime um, to make sure that, you know, I'm improving um, farm workers' lives, I'm improving Americans' lives, I'm helping to, you know, put this country on a trajectory that we know um, is so important and that for me, for the first time in my lifetime, um, that I've seen such a positive future and outlook um, not for some, not for a few, but for all Americans. I thought it was pretty cool that he's on a postage stamp, but your grandfather's bust also sits in the Oval Office. Uh, and you, of course, spent a lot of time in that office working in the White House. That has to be somewhat surreal to walk in there and see that. Um, it was extremely surreal. And at times I feel like I had to walk into the Oval Office um, and sort of keep it out of my vision um, just because it, it, it does. It's, it's such a, an emotional thing for me um, to see because 
for me, what it symbolizes is, is not just my own personal history, but um, really the history of a people um, in this country who have contributed so much, who have literally put food on our table, who have um, you know, ensured that um, you know, our families um, had what they needed and had um, the means to be able to take care of themselves and um, to be able to see that recognized in the most powerful office in the world and um, in the way that it has and to be given that sense of, of respect and dignity. Um, it represents, you know, all the people that put food on our table, not just my grandfather. Yeah. So why did you want this job? Well, for me, it really, you know, I can't think of, of anything more important right now as we think about what's at stake in our election. Um, as I talked about, you know, my family has uh, fought on behalf of working people throughout their lives and throughout their careers um, to improve the lives of others, to ensure that, you know, as a country that we were living up to our values. And I can't think of a position or a role um, in which my complete time, energy, talent is, is totally dedicated to this and to ensuring that, um, you know, it's not just uh, sort of our democracy at stake, but it's also the incredible leadership that we've seen from this president and vice president, who they are, what their lived experiences are, what they represent and symbolize. That to me is, it's too important to not be doing this job right now. The belief going in was that no matter who got the campaign manager job, their power and influence would be limited because it's everybody working with him in the West Wing that's making all the big decisions. Is that true? Or how often do you end up speaking to the president about what's going on with the campaign? Well, we connect regularly, and that's not true. As you know, um, and having uh, covered the White House, you know that they have extremely busy day jobs um, where they're juggling so much to ensure that the country is continuing to move forward, that our um, historic legislation is being implemented at every turn, and that the American people are um, really benefiting from the fact that Democrats are delivering right now. And so that's really their job. My job and the campaign's job is to make sure that Again, we're communicating with our general election voters. We're reminding folks of what's at stake in this election. We're helping to ensure that they understand the choice that's before them right now, um, because the choice could not be clearer in terms of the vision that this president and vice president have for our country, to unite our country, to move our country forward, and that of our opponents who want to continue to divide our country, um, who have um, used fear and intimidation and so many other, you know, just divisive tactics to try to move their agenda forward, which we know is an extreme agenda that voters have rejected before and they'll reject again. So there's no right or wrong answer to this. I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, how often does someone like you then talk to him directly about what's going on or the direction of the campaign? Um, I mean, it depends. Sometimes I'll get a call from him and I've known to, or I've uh, uh, trained myself to make sure I pick up um, every call. Um, so sometimes it is regular calls, sometimes it's regularly scheduled meetings. But, um, uh, you know, rest assured, he is very engaged and um, look, he knows what's at stake and he understands that, um, you know, we have an important kind of story and message to yeah. tell, um, but he also um, knows that we have an important job to do as a campaign. You, you know there are questions about his age and his abilities and whether he's going to finish the second term. As somebody who sits with him face to face on a regular basis, what do you think is the biggest misperception? I'd say that his experience is second to none, right? His ability to be able to bring this country together to tackle some of the biggest issues that we've faced, um, you know, for, in some instances, you know, for decades, um, really, you know, shines through. His ability to, you know, make sure that he's being kind of thoughtful and strategic and not allowing kind of the winds of the political winds of the day to impact his judgment, but to instead stay focused to ensure the kind of stability and the kind of leadership that this country needs right now. And that comes with, you know, the experience that he brings to the table. And you've worked alongside the vice president as her state director when she was a senator and then on the campaign. What's the biggest misperception of her? I'd say that, you know, the vice president has been so politically potent um, and we just have to look at the midterm elections um, as the most recent example of that. Um, you know, her ability to get out to meet the moment and to ensure that, um, you know, we are 
uh, you know, really bringing our message and, and really helping to ensure that, um, you know, she is able to, to show that we're, you know, continuing to fight for the people. Um, she has a career, you know, as you know, in um, uh, the, being the district attorney of San Francisco, being the attorney general of California. That's always a position that she's taken is really fighting for the people. And that's what she's continued to do um, and continue to show throughout our administration. Let me get you uh, real quick to talk about uh, Latino support specifically, because I was struck in our poll from last week that found, like every group, support for the president right now is down versus 2020. Um, notably, or at least what I found more, most interesting, more Latinos think it's more likely former President Trump will win next year than President Biden. More Hispanics say only Trump and not President Biden is healthy enough to be president. Two-thirds of Latino respondents in our poll say things in America right now aren't that great. How do you convince them otherwise? Well, you know, part of it is getting out and making sure that we're, again, reaching them and, and ensuring that they understand the accomplishments this administration has brought forward. When you look at Latino unemployment, it's record low. Um, the creation of Latino small businesses, it's the fastest that it's been in decades. Um, we've had 10.5 million new small businesses created under this administration. 25% uh, of those are Latino small businesses. Um, we've invested $11 billion in Hispanic serving institutions. So all of those are a record of accomplishment that we know matter to Latinos. Affordable health care is another one that we know is crucial. And so you, like, you know that, but how do you get out there and tell them that or remind yeah. them of that in the well, next so, 400 days? Yeah, we are um, actually up on air already, um, reaching out to Latinos. We have, uh, you know, historic ad campaign um, invested earlier than any presidential election in both English and Spanish, but also in Spanglish. I've seen that. I one. was so excited. Honestly, that was like my favorite of the entire suite um, of ads that we put out because I think it speaks to, you know, definitely to me, to younger Latinos and young Latino voters who are, you know, bilingual, bicultural, just really, you know, um, have that sense of, of identity, um, but also, you know, are um, different than their parents' generation. Um, so, and we have um, a new ad that's coming out, uh, you know, that'll be coming out later today um, called La Diferencia, or The Difference. It'll be in English and Spanish as well. And just reminding folks, again, the choice and reminding Latino voters the choice that they have before them. Um, a president and a vice president that are fighting for Latino workers and fighting to ensure that we're increasing wages and protections for Latino workers um, versus, you know, a Republican Party that continues to ship jobs overseas, that continues to to attack immigrants that continues to, you know, really um, just has been horrible for the American worker. I want to get you to respond to some of what some voters told us last weekend in Pennsylvania. And these are voters who voted for the president in 2020. I think he's too old to be president right now. Like, he doesn't know what's going on right now. I see him diminishing as far as his energy and the public life. I mean, it, it's like he had to drink a monster drink or something just to stay awake. You know what I mean? Like, he's really just very tired, and the job is arduous. So, I mean, you need someone with a little more energy level. I think he needs to be in front of voters to show that he's not the sort of doddering old man that the Republicans are trying to make him out to be. What do you make of all that? Well, you know, I think that it's important we continue to show the work that the president's doing day in and day out. Um, the most recent trip that he took overseas to the G20, I think it's a perfect example of, um, you know, the kind of schedule that he continues to keep, the kind of, you know, hard work uh, that he continues to do on behalf of the American people, and the fact that he continues to show really strong, steady leadership at every turn that, you know, is not just uh, helping to protect democracy here at home, but also abroad. Um, so many people are looking to him and to his leadership, and he's continuing to really step up and to show up both here in the country and on the international stage. Uh, and he's got to spend a lot of time doing international stuff and the day job. When are we going to see him on the trail? Well, you know, as you know, um, in a re-election campaign, it's important that the president really focuses on um, the day-to-day -day work that he has, uh, you know, during this time. And so we're going to continue to, you know, 
sort of enable him to do that as a campaign. We're going to make sure that we're getting out on the air, um, that we're also, you know, engaging in um, really building out our organization and our states. Um, he also is very engaged. He's very engaged in our fundraising efforts, um, helping to make sure that we do have a war chest going into next year that we know we're going to need um, to make sure that, again, we're reaching voters everywhere that they are. And I don't have to tell you twice, we're in a fragmented media environment, and we know um, that it's going to take hard work, um, and it's going to take the resources that we need to get there. So, um, and if folks want to join our cause, or if they want to donate, they go can ahead. also go to JoeBiden.com. Um, is he going to go visit UAW workers in Michigan? Do you know if there's any plan for that? I'm not going to get ahead of our, you know, official um, sort of office and, and sort of any potential travel plans. But I will say that this president has the strongest record when it comes to labor um, than any previous president. And as someone who grew up in the labor movement, it makes me extremely proud to see what we've been able to do as an administration. On the other hand, you know, as um, we've seen from, you know, the Republicans and um, folks like Donald Trump, they've been absolutely horrible for American auto workers. They've shipped jobs overseas. They've uh, increased, you know, tax cuts for the rich. Um, that's not the kind of, um, you know, vision that helps the American worker. Um, but we know that the, you know, vision that this president has put forward and, and what we've coined as Bidenomics is one that's investing in workers, it's investing in U.S. manufacturing and making sure that, you know, we're um, really, you know, bringing so much of these jobs back home. I got two more questions for you, two more questions. One you might not really like, one I think you will. Uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't at least check on this one. Um, the president's going to be campaigning eventually, spending a lot of time fundraising right now. Do you know there's any plan for Hunter Biden to go out and be a campaign surrogate? Um, you know, I'm not going to get ahead of our surrogates right now. At this point, you know, we're building a strong surrogate campaign um, and operation. We have the National Advisory Board. It's about 50 member, um, you know, board that we have crisscrossing the country and out on the airwaves. Um, and we'll have a great kind of uh, surrogate cohort. Um, you know, really addressing what we know are going to be, again, more extreme issues coming out of the debate stage next week in California. The grandchildren maybe will be out there at some point? I know that they're we, young voters, right? I know that we're going to continue to, you know, engage across, you know, our entire, um, you know, ecosystem of, of uh, supporters. I, I, what, it's Hispanic Heritage Month. Part of the reason we brought you here is to highlight your history. Um, and, and the historic nature of you running this campaign. I'm just curious, I asked this of someone else we interviewed earlier this week who's also Latino. What to you does it mean to be a Latino American? Um, well, for me, it's, it's an experience that, um, you know, I've lived throughout my life. It's given me so much perspective and a sense of identity, a sense of culture, a sense of tradition. Um, you know, as I think about even just growing up as a kid, one of the things that we used to do often, um, because my grandfather was um, very, you know, uh, sort of traditionally Catholic and very Mexican in that way, um, and so we would do las posadas um, and go literally house to house, um, you know, throughout the, I think it was the 12-day period. Um, and, you know, just some of those early experiences at Christmas, you know, our whole family getting together on Christmas Eve and literally having a kind of assembly line making tamales. And my favorite, you know, sort of moment was when I graduated from cleaning the hojas with all that, you know, hair um, to then being able to spread the masa and then eventually to actually filling the meat. Um, we also have a bunch of vegetarians. Did you put a lot of meat in yours or no? No, because I'm, well, we have a lot of vegetarians in our family, believe it or not. So we also came up with bean tamales, with uh, the chili and cheese, which I know are, are much more popular now. Um, so we would have to iterate kind of along the way. For a couple of years, I was vegan too. That didn't make my grandmother very happy because <laughs> then we had to come up with a whole new, um, a whole new pot um, just for me. But, you know, look, those are... Um, experiences that I've had that have just enriched my life. It's given me a sense of, again, who I am um, and just a real sense of connection to our community. And as I've had the opportunity to travel, um, you know, throughout the world to different regions to see those similarities and those different sort of connections have been, um, I don't know, just one of the real sort of highlights of my life. Well, you've been generous with your time. We appreciate it. Uh, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, safe travels on the campaign trail and we'll hopefully do this again. Thank you, sir.